level of enthusiasm for UFC 300, what would you say? Strong, very strong. And I did compare the cards of 100, 200, and 300, like you guys were talking about earlier in terms of the depth. And even though 200 was grossly deep and still succeeded in my mind, despite losing so many big fights from Connor Nate 2 at first, and then obviously DC John 2. But man, for not having the main event we necessarily wanted, 300 is loaded. It's going to be fantastic. Hopefully for one night, it'll make us forget not only my echoing audio in here, but also, um, you know, this current apex reality that we're going through, which kind of blows. And, you know, also all those old fighters probably could have changed the sport, but they took the short-term money too. So we can put all that crap aside, Luke, <laughs> along with the debates of how smart is that cage actually, right? I mean, you know, in terms of the PFL, let's focus on what matters here. 300 rules, and I'm about a nine and a half out of 10 in terms of wow. explosively ready. But I've also eaten decently bad yesterday, so the explosive part is is you know multi-dimensional yeah fair enough okay uh let's start with the main event we're gonna go on down the card chuck i'll All start right. with you here you know what's interesting in some ways alex pereira has already achieved everything he could possibly hope mm -hmm. right uh 185 champion in ufc 205 champion in ufc headlining this card right. obviously his background in kickboxing as decorated as they come in certain cases here he is fighting Jamal Hill. It's an important fight. It's a relevant fight. It's a UFC 300. Obviously, if he loses, it would be bad for him. It would mm -hmm. be great for Jamal. I'm not saying that there are no stakes. There are significant sure. ones. But it just feels to me like everything that could have mattered for Alex Pereira, like if he lost here, would people really dock him? I, I'm not sure that they would. <sighs> He's kind of, again, as, as one of those guys who's ascended very fast. You know, it's funny. Today's April 8th. We're, do, we're on Monday taping this. And... uh it was one year ago today that he lost his middleweight title against Izzy Adesanya at Madison Square Garden. One mm -hmm. year ago. And in that time, he has not only overcome the loss, he's went up, like reinvented himself at 205, beat the guy that Izzy couldn't beat in Blohovich, then beats Yuri to win the vacant title. Now comes around to Jamal Hill. So within a, within a, uh, within a year's time, one year, he's able to put himself at UFC 300, it's an ins it's an insane story. The fact that the, the the thing I love about it, it's a guy, right? He's going up against Jamal Hill, who beat down his mentor and friend, Glover Teixeira. Like he's going up against a guy who broke a record of plus, I think it was one fifty seven or something like that, and the and the strike significant strike differential for five rounds battered him. So you have like these elements to this fight that are a lot of fun. Now is it UFC three hundred? Was it going to be the caliber that people were looking for? Maybe not. But I do think it's a fascinating thing, especially from Alex Pereira. He could blow up in bigger and crazier ways. Headlining this one, right, and becoming that guy who uh, basically has turned it around and now has just about anything on the table that would be a huge fight. I just think that for him, the stakes are weird. But for him specifically, if he wins, I think it blows up for him. Mm. Yeah, I think this is all about uh, Alex Pereira. And it's no disrespect to Jamal Hill, who... Certainly didn't luck into the title, but there were circumstances that fell into his favor, the ankle of draw that opened up the opportunity. And of course, he gave it to Glover in a very uh, all-action, gruesome affair. Yes, you have sort of that Ali Frazier one vibe of the old champion who never lost his belt coming back to beat the current one, right? We saw that obviously in Habib versus Connor in the same way. But it's really like Chuck was saying, it's about Pereira and what he has done in such a short time. Here's an interesting stat that I think I've figured out. You can tell the, the real donks can tell me if I'm wrong. Pedeta has an opportunity in this fight to win against a former or current UFC champion in his fifth consecutive fight. Yes, he has that loss in between to Adesanya, so it's not a perfect streak, but this has a chance to be five consecutive wins over current or former UFC champions. The only one under my research who's been able to equal that is John Jones beginning with Shogun mm. Hua and the first five fights of his title reign. And the only female is the great Amanda Nunes, who, if this is a real record, would have eight consecutive. But to be fair, that streak only became a streak when Rocky Pennington just recently won the vacant women's Bantamweight title in a fight that we were, you know, kind of complaining, no disrespect to Raquel, <laughs> about the quality and whether that should have been even better title fight. Still, that speaks to... What legends do? That's John Jones and Amanda Nunes that you're putting yourself in there. And if there is a little bit of a gap right now in terms of true individual UFC star power, then Pedeta 
he's he's you know, a win here puts him one step closer to really cracking that open. I mean, we still have some aging brands. We still have guys on the way up, obviously, to mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how Chuck was able to fit in that studio with the size of Luke's Bonaire after uh, Taporia <laughs> posed with uh, Messi there. But I really think if you look at That's it, seven funny. fights into his career, two division champion. And now if he goes out there and beats a very capable and dangerous former champion who never lost the belt, Guys, we are looking at, seriously, a all-time great, not just in this sport, but in combat sports in general. And I don't know if anybody outside of maybe Holly Holm, who's also on this card, would have a comparable all-combat sports resume. And maybe Jamal Hill doesn't make him go from here to here, but it would be another addition on a guy who, for eight fights, this will be his eighth UFC fight. He's headlined pay-per-views in Madison Square Garden and now 300. We are watching in such a short <laughs> term one of the greatest achievers. I mean, this really this dwarfs what Henry Cejudo was able to do in a short mm. period in my mind because you have to look at that quality of opposition and that Sean Strickland win just got better by the fact that he won the championship after that. And that was a close and competitive fight. When he came in here, Alex Pereira, we were like, okay, wait till the wrestlers get a hold of him. The wrestlers got true. a hold of him and he's still that standing. Uh, there, there was a long time, real quick, where it was when he beat Israel Adesanya, he, he held the title at 185, that we would debate, could he beat anybody else in the top five of the middleweight division? And most of us were like, nah, I don't know if he could. Like, because there was that question mark. Could, you know, if somebody really was dedicated, doggedly going to wrestle him, could he withstand that? We didn't know. And I think a lot of us were like, maybe not. You know what I mean? It's a crazy trajectory. Like to go from where he, like where he was perceptionally, uh, perception to where he's at now. BC, let me uh, push, not push back, but uh, piggyback if I may, which is two things I think are actually up for, not grabs exactly, but two things are possible here with this fight. One, everything you said I agree with. What I, let me add something. There's a lot of moaning about the state of the heavyweight division and even the light heavyweight division. If Pereira goes in there and Jamal will have to oblige him in some capacity, but if Pereira goes in there and has an incredible performance, Chuck, mm-hmm. and looks amazing, you know, it's going to be interesting because you know Trump is going to, in all likelihood, <laughs> going to be there, which is kind of weird because I actually don't oh, he'll think, be there. like, no one is like, well, this party doesn't get started until the guy who's nearly fucking 80 gets here. <laughs> he but, gets the biggest walk out of the night. I know. You kidding? Well, I think they do it to trigger people who don't like Trump, yes. but neither here nor there. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is, dude, he will make light heavyweight, not, not great again per se, but fun again. Yeah. Where you're like, dude, th- maybe this division's not the the, the best, right. but that fucking guy at the top, guarantee is going to make this shit must watch. Also, I will say this: Jamal Hill has his fair share of online detractors, <laughs> but if he goes in there and polishes off Alex Pereira after beating Glover, you do, you're talking about a guy who is was not given his due and would go in there and fucking demand it. Either one of those possibilities, BC, are fucking great. Yeah, and people also are sleeping on the one fact. The fact, this is going to be an offensive shootout. There's no question about it. This is going to be a great fight. And while we've been looking for stability at light heavyweight in the post-John Jones era, something we've never been able to find, what we have been able to find are certainly great stories from Jan Blachowicz going from sort of journeyman to champion, Glover Teixeira at his age. We've also had all action awesomeness. I mean, even Blahovich beating Dominic Reyes. I mean, it's been one banger after another. Nothing about this fight on paper doesn't scream absolute bang air. Like, they're like, like just <laughs> bongtastic. Yes. But even more, maybe call, this call, guy call is. Call this that fight stability. the bang bus because there's going to be a lot going on. <laughs> sure. All, you know, auditions on the couch. Let's go. This fight also could provide that stability that we kind of like at times in a division for one guy to be in charge and everybody running after him. I haven't loved that we've talked somewhat negatively or, pat, or, you know, dismissively about this division because of how the title opportunities have bounced around. I mean, that Ankali of draw really shot a, you know, a hole mm-hmm. in the balloon of momentum or emotion that we had and a love for this division. But to your point, not only could Padeta return that or even Jamal Hill with a big win, how about this? Like, I know Malikin just became a three three division champion in major MMA with one, but we can always sort of argue like we did, should there be an asterisk because of how they do weight and the fact that he really weighed in at 205 for a middleweight bout. Yeah. I really think from a UFC standpoint, from a traditional way of doing it, Padeta might actually have the best. Did I just call him Padeta again? Yeah, Pereira might Padeta. actually. Yeah. Potato might actually have the best <laughs> chance 
to legitimately try this, legitimately try this. And I know this could have been him versus Aspinall for the interim, and I'm glad they didn't do it. But, like, he's going to run quickly out of major light heavyweights to beat if he stays on this pace. Maybe we end up seeing him become that first one in the UFC to attempt that. Couldn't happen to a guy that I that I respect more. I mean, the way that he rallied against Izzy, the way that he bounced back from the devastating knockout loss to Izzy, dude, this guy's a real one. And, and, you know, I don't tend to know the insides of his relationship with Merle and how that fell apart. He looks a lot happier now, but this is her loss. <laughs> You're fired. Get the fuck off the screen. <laughs> Chuck, what about the Jamal Hill side? I was going to say. Everyone, yeah. everyone is focusing on the Alex side, which, exactly. to BC's point, like there's so many interesting elements about his story and how much he's packed into a short UFC run. I understand why the spotlight is on him. At the same time, Forget about Jamal Hill fighting with everyone on Twitter. Just put right. that aside for the moment. My concern is that he came back from injury. I don't know, but his timeline seemed to it's be like expedited. July, right? right. His timeline seemed to be expedited to get here. I know. So that does give me pause. However, his story is comically overlooked. Is it not? That's what I was just about okay. to throw to you. I was just about to say this because he's a he's a finisher. Like and, and he's been a killer since literally he's been I mean, he's been in this division. And I don't know why he doesn't get his due, to be honest. And it, it was crazy because I don't think it was Alex Pereira that people were mad about when they announced this main event. If they said it was Alex and Izzy, people would have been awesome with it. But it's just, it's one of those things that somehow Jamal Hill doesn't get across. And I don't know if this type of event, this is way bigger than he's ever had, obviously, than all these guys. If he goes in there and he starches Alex Pereira, especially at his own game, stand up, Hits him at distance or something because he can do that too. Knocks him out. The best distance fighter probably in the division, if not the UFC. He's a kickboxer extraordinaire. 99% of his strikes are from distance. If he's able to do that and put him away, I, I wonder. I'm very curious to see, does he get over in the same way we're talking about Pereira? Because I, I, you can see it from Alex's side. Where does it put Jamal Hill? I don't know. Like, Does that catapult him finally? Or is it? does he just rub people the wrong way? It's Some people just do that. For whatever reason, they just don't get over in the bigger sense because they rub people the wrong way. BC, why hasn't Jamal caught on with the fans? Because I believe that they look at him as a little bit of a hothead and malcontent for how he turned, not turned, but how he speaks up for himself and publicly defends himself for his own truths. We may disagree at times with, with, with the, you know, what fighters are fighting for or fighting after, but I do respect when guys are vocal and are willing to do that. He's very willing to do that. So if you get into arguments online with fans, and there are, I mean, look, Ariel Hawani is pretty popular last time I checked. So if you get into kind of a little bit of a war with him and if people side with Ariel, you can suddenly be looked at as a villain. And also don't miss this. The injury happened apparently that, you know, that pulled him out of the title picture and forced him to vacate his belt in a basketball game. And I'm not going to sit here and say, an active UFC fighter shouldn't play basketball or ride a motorcycle or do that. But I think fans looked at that as like, see, I never liked that guy. And he just blew his big chance fooling around in a hoops game. And a lot of that is unfair, but I think when you sort of are looked at as a malcontent, they, they brand you as a villain. And until something changes, and a lot of times, by the way, things that change those narratives happen inside the cage, right? I mean, if he goes out mm -hmm. there and did what you teased and soundly, not even soundly, just defeated Pereira, regained his belt, put his lineage back in line, we would have so much additional respect for him. And I have a lot of respect for Jamal Hill. I think he is slept on and one of the one of the most underrated fighters in this sport without question. Mm. But when you win the championship in sort of the backdoor fashion, people are always good. People held that against Daniel that, Cormier that's, that's because story, he didn't go through John your Jones. life. <laughs> Winning the championship right. in the backdoor fashion? Uh, me and Puff Diddy. Puff Diddy, to be fair. But that's probably another, you know, I don't know if we should. Me and Puff Diddy. <laughs> Chuck? 15 months, he'll be, a, he, if he will have been out. And what, nine Jesus. months from the injury? Yeah. If he goes in there and does it, and that doesn't earn him respect, you know, from the, from the, from the fan base at large, I don't know what would. I mean, that's just a that's a crazy thing. Like we're not even talking about cage, cage rust and things like that because you're just like that's second or third down the line of all the things he's kind of going up against here. So I, mean, it, I think he earns it if he goes in there and does this. I you got to give him the respect. I, I think BC did a great job of laying out some of the reasons why he hasn't necessarily connected with the yeah. fan base. But 300 is his chance to I think so recoup all of that. I just want to remind folks, dude. Jamal Hill is tough as shit. 
Remember, Paul Craig broke his arm and the shit was flopping. Yep. And the look on his face was, damn, is the bus going to be late again? <laughs> Shoot. Like, he is, he is, and I say this as a compliment, he's like a little psychotic with it. So, so. Look, really what, fun What's one. his coach's name? Because they seem to have a very good relationship in terms of game planning. And I love the way they approach striking from, from, from the boxing sense. I think they are a little bit ahead of the game in some of those areas. Yeah, I agree with a, a lot of that. And and listen, I mean, listen, the, the the major criticism of this fight that I think really is fair is that if you look at like UFC 100, for example, mm -hmm. and then all 200 before John Jones fucked it all up, right? But and Connor was supposed to be on a video. Connor yeah. and Nate, yeah. but that was different because he didn't want to do PR, right, so right, that right, was right. different. But the point I'm trying to make was in those two cases, you had two fighters on a collision course. This one they just kind yeah. of put together. Yes, but even with that, the possibilities for the winner here are yeah. extraordinary. You got to love it. I really do. I mean, the Izzy trilogy at 205, right, could be in the balance. 100%. You know? 100%.